Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. Um, tonight I'm looking at a phenomenal book, um, which I'd, I'd urge anyone to read. Um, Stalin's Nemesis, The Exile and Murder of Leon Trotsky by Bertrand Patanode. Um It's one of the best books that I have ever read on Soviet history uh, and on the power struggle to succeed Lenin and obviously on the, the, the fate of Trotsky in his exile in um, uh, Turkey and France and, and Mexico. But one of the things that's great about this book is that it's an intellectual history uh, and it it goes in the final chapter into the kind of almost like the afterlife of Trotsky's ideas and the reason why I want to talk about this and why it's important is that it's very difficult to understand the history of the left uh, the, the international left in the 20th century without understanding the uh, currents the kind of the competing currents of uh, Marxist Leninism Stalinism Trotskyism and um, uh, democratic socialism, uh, and where where they intersect, and there there are some surprising aspects to the the kind of the the story of um, Trotskyism of of his kind of adherence in people who who you know in some ways saw them as his themselves as his disciples. There were those who eventually spiral off. To kind of essentially kind of neoconservatism and um, neoliberalism, um, and who um, reject entirely um, Trotsky's um, Trotsky's ideas, and there are those who have carried the kind of the torch of Trotskyism in of, in some variety or another into the twenty first century. So I suppose. What, how how do we think about Trotskyism? What is it? And Trotskyism, I suppose you 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 could define it as a uh, less a kind of political program and more a critique. To a, to a large part, kind of Marxism was uh, it offered um, certain sort of the possibilities of political programs, but it was largely a critique of capitalism. Trotskyism, much of Trotsky's writings. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to kind of sum, it, sum up the vast amount that Trotsky wrote, but an awful lot of it are crit- explanations of the fate of the Russian Revolution, explanations for Stalinism, and critiques of what Stalin's Russia had become. And Trotsky essentially says that it's not a revolutionary state; it's a reactionary one. This is a, 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 a this is a state capitalist society. Um, the the revolution itself was throttled in its infancy largely by bureaucrats who, uh, instead of wanting the ideas that Trotsky proposed, which was continual revolution or permanent revolution, uh, opted for the building of socialism in one country, the uh, uh, collectivization of agriculture and the five-year plans and the building of a large defence industry to war to uh, face off against the inevitable threat from fascism so that does kind of Trotsky's body of thought no justice at all by the way this is as, a, as brief a summation as we can get in a 25 minute podcast um, but what I want to do now is look in the final chapter of Stalin's nemesis so Bertrand Patanode writes Trotsky's ashes are buried in the patio of his home in Khoyakan, beneath a monolith engraved of, uh, with a large hammer and sickle. The Mexican government bought the house from Natalia in November 1940 and arranged for her to reside there as its caretaker. Over the next 20 years, she maintained the house just as it uh, was when Trotsky lived there, leaving, um, unattu- um, leaving untouched even the remaining bullet holes from the May 1940 assault. This is, of course, the uh, attack by uh, the assassin Ramon Mojada uh, and his uh, accomplices that resulted in the murder of Leon Trotsky. He was obviously a uh, a, a, a Soviet agent, um, and the assassination uh, was um, commissioned by Stalin himself. Stalin also... Uh, Natalia, I beg your pardon. Natalia also kept a close eye on Trotsky's political legacy. 
in the United States, the red decade of the 1930s ended with a veritable stampede from Marxism. The exodus was abetted by the outpouring of patriotism during the Second World War. Despite the wartime alliance between the United States and Uncle Joe, Stalin's USSR, Trotsky's Fourth International persisted nonetheless, led from New York by James Cannon of the Socialist Workers' Party. Into the post-war years, the Fourth International uh, continued to adhere to Trotsky's old position that Stalin's USSR was a degenerate workers' state, a designation it also applied to the Soviet bloc countries of Eastern Europe, which had been occupied by the Red Army at the end of the war. So let's unpack that a little bit. So there was, during the 1920s and 30s, a, uh, a, a large and confident um, democratic and revolutionary left in, in America um, of um, revolutionary parties and societies, um, a, a, a large um, communist party of the USA. Um, there were radical and revolutionary newspapers sold in uh, most of the uh, major cities on the East Coast. There was uh, an active trade union movement and this um, the the crises of the 1930s only swell um, the the ranks of this kind of uh, working class movement in, in America. Anything that is uh, associated with Marxism after 19, about 1944 suddenly becomes incredibly politically toxic, and there is um, a, a, a realization that America's wartime relationship of convenience with the USSR will come to an end at a certain point and perhaps um, is, uh, is a, a higher price has been exacted by Stalin um, than uh, the, US, the USA would ideally want to have paid. Sean McMeekin's book, Stalin's War, um, over, of which there's been some controversy um, I'm still hoping to get onto the, uh, the 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 podcast. One of our listeners who we've had some uh, really interesting debates about it as, as a book. I think it has some merits, but is a very uh, is a problematic read. But Sean McMeekin's argument is that the infiltration of the USSR of the USA by the USSR even during the 1930s was 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 quite extensive uh, and uh, Roosevelt bears a lot of blame for this for you know in uh, Sean McMeekin's view complacency not sure but we'll come back to that another time but the the point being that is is this sudden and noticeable and a, a radical sea change in American public opinion um, away from socialist parties and ideas. Natalia was increasingly sceptical of this assessment, of the uh, assessment of the, the, socialist, the American Socialist Workers' Party, which survived into uh, the 1950s and 60s, um, of the, the Soviet Union. She believed that were Trotsky alive, he would not consider the post-war USSR to be any kind of worker state. Privately, she told the leaders of the Fourth International that Stalinism had now completely destroyed the revolution and that the so-called people's democracies of Eastern Europe were nothing more than Soviet vassal states, which you know I think is a fair assessment. The last straw for Natalia was the Korean War, which broke out in June 1950 and which Trotsky's disciples portrayed as a mortal struggle of the colonial peoples of the East against American imperialism. Natalia resigned from the Fourth International, a decision she explained at great length in an open letter to its executive committee. In it she recalled that um, the greeting sent to her by the recent Congress of the Socialist Workers' Party, which had assured her that the party continued to be guided by Trotsky's ideas. I must tell you that I read these lines with much bitterness, Natalia said. As you will see from what I am writing, writing to you, I do not see his ideas in your politics. So, let's un again, let's unpack that. So, the, the uh, post 
posthumous kind of carriers of, of the Trotskyite torch um, looked upon the events like the Korean War as a struggle between the colonised peoples and American imperialism. And Natalia um, believed that, Natalia Sedov, uh, Trotsky's uh, widow, um, believed that this was a nonsense and that um, all that Trotsky would have looked at it would have, uh, would have been a, a war between two imperialisms um, and that the, um, the, the Soviet-backed North Korea and eventually Maoist-backed North Korea uh, waging war against America had no moral legitimacy, certainly was not interested in representing the oppressed peoples of Asia, nor capable of representing their interests, nor had any mandate to do so. So um, she she looked upon this as a kind of like an uh, as a nonsense. Stalin's death in March 1953 was a major turning point in Soviet history. Lavrenti Beria was executed later that year um, as the terror came to an end and the camps began to release their prisoners. Emerging as Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev delivered a momentous speech in the 20th Party Congress of, the, of February 1956 denouncing Stalin's crimes and his cult of personality. Khrushchev limited his criticism to the wickedness of Stalin and his henchmen, carefully avoiding a wholesale indictment of the Soviet system. Khrushchev's destalinization led to the political rehabilitation of selected victims of the terror, though not the defendants in the major purge trials and certainly not Trotsky, whose name and image had been thoroughly erased in Stalin's time from books, museums and films. Trotsky remained uh, useful as a Soviet bogeyman. However, when Mao Zedong accused Khrushchev of revisionism and challenged his leadership of the world communist movement, the Kremlin condemned the Chinese communists for their neo-Trotskyist uh, deviation. Uh, after Khrushchev's speech, Natalia addressed a letter to the Soviet government in the person of Clement Voroshilov, her husband's old antagonist, going back to the days of the Russian Civil War. As chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, Voroshilov was now formerly head of state. Natalia wrote to him to ask for information about her son, Serozhia, um, the last news that she heard about him was his arrest in 1937 uh, as a mass poisoner. Natalia never received a reply to, a reply to her letter. Um, there were lo many, many members of the, the kind of the wider Trotsky family, including Trotsky's son Lev, who died in very suspicious circumstances in, in Russia. Uh, or who were uh, shipped off to the gulags and never heard of again. Um, but to, to go back to um, this um, rehabilitation or not um, of uh, certain figures, but definitely not, not of Trotsky. Trotsky's name by the, the 1930s, and certainly by the 1950s, had become a synonym for or all that was bad um, with um, the the revolution, all that had not occurred, all that had failed, all that had been uh, un unable to happen, um, and and it becomes so divorced from any any meaningful reality, it becomes sort of like the I suppose the equivalent of um, um, kind of right wing conservatives and sort of fascist types at the moment describing anything they don't like as woke you know eventually kind of trotskyist neo trotskyist deviationism means virtually nothing it means you're not following the uh, stalinist marxist leninist um party line um the fact that um Mao viewed um, a uh, Trotsky, uh, Khrushchev as, be, as doing essentially the same thing, I guess, sort of speaks volumes, really. It's interesting that uh, of all the places for Trotskyism uh, or post Soviet Trotskyism to take root, the place where it grows its deepest roots really is the United States. There was a steady stream of uh, earnest young intellectuals, journalists and revolutionaries from America 
who made pilgrimages to um, Trotsky's home in Koyokan and uh, some staying there, uh, others working for Trotsky. Um, back home in America, the, the de development of the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, of which a, a kind of a variant uh, arrived in, in Great Britain in the late 1960s, is, and is the, the kind of SWP of now, um, uh, was under immense scrutiny from the US government, and uh, Bertrand Patenaud writes, on the afternoon of the 27th of June 1941, a team of FBI agents and US marshals raided the branch headquarters of the Socialist Workers' Party in Minneapolis and St. Paul. They seized, a, they seized a large amount of radical literature, two red flags, and an autographed photo of Trotsky. On the basis of this and other evidence, the federal authorities charged 29 Trotskyist militants with conspiracy against the US government. Four of the accused were national leaders of the Socialist Workers' Party, James Cannon, Farrell Dobbs, Al Goldman and Felix Morrow. Fourteen others were connected to the Teamsters, including uh, Ray Rainbolt, the chief of the, uh, of the Union's uh, Defence Guard, and Dorothy Schultz, Hank's wife and Twin Cities Secretary of the Workers' Defence League, as well as former Koyakan guards Jake Cooper and Emil Hansen, uh, the better half of the disgruntled duo Bill and Emil. The indictment contained two counts, the first of which was charged the defendants with conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States through armed revolution. The prosecution sought to demonstrate that the actual that the accused um, took their inspiration from the Rus from the Russian Revolution and the ideas from Lenin and Trotsky, and accordingly certain of the defendants would, and they did, go to Mexico. This is part of the, uh, the indictment. Uh, to Mexico City, Mexico, there to advise and to receive the advice, counsel and guidance and directions of said Leon Trotsky. The second count involved, in, invoked the Smith Act of 1940, which made it a criminal offence to advocate the overthrow of the US government. Among the evidence presented in court was Trotsky's photograph and his writings, along with the published works of Marx and Engels and Lenin. So it's all fairly, fairly flimsy stuff. All the defendants were cleared of, cons of the conspiracy charge, but 18 of them were found guilty of violating the Smith Act, including Cannon, Dobbs, Goldman, Cooper and Hansen. Their prison sentence ranged from a year and a day to 16 months, and they began serving on the 1st of January 1944. The Communist Party aided the Justice Department in prose prosecuting, here's the interesting bit, prosecuting these Trotskyists by providing incriminating documents, some of which had been collected by Sylvia Caldwell, Cannon's secretary, who was an informant for the NKVD. After she was exposed by a communist defector in 1954, she was brought before a grand jury, refused to testify, including uh, invoking her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. She finally confessed to her, NKD, uh, her NKVD past before a second grand jury in 1958. So you have the Communist Party of the USA, a Stalinist institution, a Stalinist party, um, uh, part of Comintern, helping the US government to hunt down and prosecute Trotskyists. Um, and the, the some, sometimes when one thinks about the um, the imperative of you know solidarity and uh, the and, and that the the kind of the mind rather boggles with the 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 outrageous cynicism of um, Stalinists working with the uh, the kind of the 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 epitome of of, of capitalist state power to persecute. Uh, another one of the most telling stories in the the kind of like the afterlife of Trotskyism was that of uh, James Burnham, James Burnham, who along with Sidney Hook in 1933 had organised the American Workers' Party, um, which had uh, merged uh, with the Communist League um, to form the U.S. Workers' Party uh, the following year. Um, he led the Trotskyist wing without, within the party, which was subsequently thrown out um, and formed the um, uh, Socialist Workers in, in, in the end. Um, 
it formed uh, sorry, big it formed the Socialist Party of America, um, which eventually um, uh, the the Trotskyists were forced out of that too, um, and formed the Socialist Workers Party in 1937. Um, the Trotsky was a correspondent with Burnham. They, they wrote to one another throughout the 1930s. Um, and, and Burnham was, was a great admirer of Trotsky's, um, but later became a kind of a uh, uh, one of his bitterest enemies. Bertrand Patternode writes, James Burnham, once Trotsky's most formidable adversary and bête noire inside the Socialist Workers' Party, turned his thesis about a brave new world of bureaucratic collectivism into a hugely successful book, the Managerial Revolution, published in 1941. Um, as far as influential books on political science of the 20th century goes, this is kind of up there with the best of them. The Managerial Revolution is a, a hugely groundbreaking book for a whole range of reasons, but we won't talk about that now. The book stirred enormous controversy, not least because of the author's apparent cold-bloodedness about the dawning age of authoritarianism pioneered by so the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and, in Burnham's opinion, uh, New Deal America. George Orwell accused Burnham of looking forward to a German victory in the war and, of totalita of a to and to a totalitarian future, a charge Burnham denied. Orwell later drew on Burnham's dark vision to create his dystopian masterpiece 1984. After the war, the fiercely anti-communist Burnham, who'd had something of a kind of a uh, a revolu a, a sort of like a Damascene moment in the late 1930s, fell out with Cold War liberals uh, over their objections to the red baiting crusader uh, crusade of Senator Joseph McCarthy, and he moved towards the political right in 1955. The year of McCarthy's downfall, Burnham helped William F. Buckley, Jr., um, launch the conservative weekly National Review, contributing as a columnist and, to a, and, and a senior editor. So Buckley being really kind of one of the founding figures of um, Ameri modern American conservatism um, and the, the, week, the National Review uh, being the kind of the, the house magazine of the American right. So it shows you how far Burnham had shifted from left to right. But Burnham, uh, Burnham's kind of advocacy of McCarthyism was that he had seen uh, communism up close, he had been part of the revolutionary left, he, had now, he was now a convert, and he said basically you cannot fight and you cannot fight any liberal enemy using liberal methods. You, you have to uh, get be, be as ruthless as they are. Burnham and his fellow editors were um, early and unwavering champions of Ronald Reagan, who they helped get elected to the White House in 1980. In 1982, in a speech he gave to the British House of Commons, President Reagan famously declared, the march of freedom and democracy will leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history. Few were aware at the time that Reagan's words were an ironic echo of Trotsky's banishment of the Mensheviks into the dustbin of history back in 1917. In 1983, the year Reagan characterised the Soviet Union as an evil empire, he awarded Burnham the Presidential Medal of Freedom. There is a kind of a long history of um, uh, kind of journeys from the left to the right. Um, throughout the the kind of the uh, the story of, of neoconservatism all the way up to um, the uh, to the the Iraq War of two thousand and three, there were uh, former uh, kind of alumni of the revolutionary left in there who had um, uh, really uh, shifted violently to to the right. So Burnham's story is by no means unique. But but telling in in general about um, the, the kind of the fluidity of 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 twentieth century ideas and twentieth century kind of uh, political ideas. Um, and what I want to do in in sort of some kind of closing comments is is sort of draw all the strands of this podcast um, together. Here you have this um, figure, this titanic figure in twentieth century history. Leon Trotsky, who, uh, for 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 good reasons and bad, 
um, shaped uh, the, 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 the history of thought in the 20th century and whose ideas outlive him, uh, as, as they often do, uh, outlive his violent murder. And, uh, and whose adherents carry them on in all sorts of ways that were perhaps un- unintended. I mean, you know, there are, are all manner of people that attest to being Marxists um, after Marx's death, who um, uh, Marx's uh, ancestors and uh, friends and fellow travellers and Friedrich Engels uh, said, well, you know, that's completely not what, what Marx I- I- intended. Um, and, and and Trotsky Trotsky's ideas um, have been similarly, uh, shall we say, used, appropriated, uh, and um, endorsed, rejected, uh, and put to kind and, and sort of weaponized in some ways, um, and it sort of it tells us um, how the the kind of the, 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 the central titanic figure of the intellectual has very little say, very little control, very little power, uh, other than, you know, whilst alive being a man of letters saying, no, I don't think you're right and, you know, don't quote me on that and uh, I reject what you're having to say. I mean, and as, as a result, you know, Trotsky spent a great part of his life uh, in a series of kind of furious debates while Stalin was accumulating his power, Trotsky was in exile, uh, angrily arguing with um, other people on the left uh, on kind of revolutionary points of order uh, of economics and diplomacy and um, um, dialectical materialism and all these these, these sorts of things. Uh, and one of the kind of the characteristic features of the revolutionary left is this kind of endless schisma, schismatic or schismatism perhaps um, which is always a gift to um, the forces of capitalism um, and one of the reasons why they seem to relentlessly win everything all the time anyway on on that bleak note I'll, I'll finish um, I've added another an, an interesting article um, to the uh, Explaining History website um, uh, all about the kind of the, um, the, the, the state of the far right around the world at the moment so go and, go and check it out I'm sure it's, a, uh, it's an entertaining read um, and I'm, I'm looking to add a little bit more content here and there I'm doing a sh- few shorts on our YouTube channel uh, some things for students and um, Uh, things of general interest so check that out and i'll catch you on the next explaining history podcast take care everybody all the best bye-bye